Yeah, let's get started. Welcome everyone uh, to our today's webinar about the challenges of digital retrofitting for innovation and as well R&D teams. My name is Fabian and I'm the product manager of Akensa and I'm also the moderator of the today's session. It is our great pleasure that we have one, two speakers. We have one, Philip Gosho on the first hand. He is head of R&D at Georg Fischer. And secondly, we have one, Linard Bart, which is research associate at the Zurich um, University of Applied Sciences. So before we start, I invite every one of you to drop all the questions you're going to have the next minutes to put them into the Q&A window from the Zoom. End of the webinar, we're going to have this session um, to answer all your open questions. Well, what topics uh, are we going to discuss during the webinar? First of all, we're going to see and we're going to discuss what the digital retrofit is. We're going to hear a great example of Georg Fischer about their smart connected product, which calls High Clean Connect, and how also Akensa was able to help there to reaching a smart connected product. And as a third part, we're going to hear Leonard speaking about the scientific approach of value creation based on a digital twin framework. Well, first of all, what is a digital retrofit? You may have wondered what that means. Digital retrofitting means the process of upgrading a legacy or undigitalized product into a smart connected product. And this is not related to a specific industry that really can be yeah, applied in various different industries. You connect basically a certain product to the cloud. And why are companies doing so? So a company, first of all, wants to improve efficiency. They also want to improve uh, cost savings and time savings for sure. And companies, they want to also create new business models to their own customers. Meaning, for example, um, selling an added value to the customer that wasn't uh, existing even before. And last but not least, uh, companies, they are willing to extend the machinery lifetime. I'm thinking here about um, predictive maintenance that enables you um, the replacement of spare parts before a product or a machine um, shuts down. Well, who is a cancer and what are we actually doing Akensa is a Zurich IoT startup that has an IoT platform as their main product. Our IoT platform enables the integration of various sensors and various protocols into our product with this gateway that you see here circled red. On our platform, we do the entire device data processing and device management including storing the data. And on top of our product, we do run an advanced rule engine that allows you the notification of alarms, such as an alarm to an SMS or a mail or a webhook integration. On the other hand, from our product, we offer an API that allows you some communication with an ERP or CRM system or with an analytic customized application, whatever you have already in place. Out of the box, what we offer on top are the business intelligence models. BI models are meant to cover most used use cases, for example, in the application of smart cities or smart buildings. I'm thinking here about the use case of occupancy management that shows you the um, occupancy of a specific floor or a building or area where you're in. These were just a few words about Akensa. Now I would like to hand over to Philip 
as a first speaker. And I'm really curious what you, Philip, are going to tell us about the project execution of the High Clean Connect product. The stage is yours. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Fabian. So let's try to share my screen. So thanks to be part of this webinar. Um, I'd like to speak about uh, three different topics. It's first of all, who, who is George Fisher? Who are we? Um, what are our drivers for digitalization? And then uh, our case in the digital retrofit. Um, so George Fisher, most of you might know it, um, Swiss company, uh, we are based on three divisions. Uh, one division is uh, GF Piping Systems, that's the one we are in. Uh, we have uh, two orders, one is casting solution, one machining solution. Uh, globally, we are located on 142 sites. Uh, we have roughly about 15,000 employees globally uh, and uh, revenue in 2019 of 3.7 billion Swiss francs. So it's one of the bigger companies we have in Switzerland and uh, for sure one of the biggers uh, in the industrial sector. Um, if I zoom a little bit in, in <laughs> A corporate structure, it's still quite difficult to, to see um, what's, where, who are we uh, locally. So um, we are located at George Fisher's JRG. Uh, it's the competence center of building technology of George Fisher Piping System, uh, located in CISAF, that's close to Basel in Switzerland. Uh, we are around 300 employees on site. It's a production site, so there are no sales people in, in this number. And we have roughly about uh, 150 million turnover per year. So what is our product? Um, I think we are the premium brand for drinking water installations, um, including pipes, including uh, valves, technical uh, water distribution parts. Um, we are quite proud to, to have uh, the most um, efficient valves and fittings made of corrosion resist resistant gun metal. And uh, our systems are built to have uh, hygiene and safe water transport in a single family home, but also in large scale buildings and public environments. So this was just a very brief uh, introduction of George Fisher. I know it's not the main topic, um, but uh, it's for me also important to, to give you a little bit an insight where you can find our product. So if you live in a house, then usually you can see our products in the basement. Um, if you are in the living area, then usually uh, our products are built into the wall. So we are somehow hidden um, and taking uh, taking care that you get the right water and the right quality and the right temperature uh, if you open the tap. Um, for sure, as I mentioned before, we also are part of public buildings or larger, um, larger homes, hospitals, etc. Um, what are the drivers for digitalization and potable water? Um, I would like to point out four of them. I think one, what is very important for us is that we make the systems or the installation of the systems very easy. Uh, this, I will come on this topic later on, but 
Um, you can can hear all around, or the most of you who have built uh, their home, uh, they they face the problem that you have a lot of provisions in the building, and usually at at the boundary between two provisions, um, there there are possible cases where something can happen and doesn't work at the end, and. That's why it's very, for us, it's crucial to build the products to be plug and play and, and self-installing. Another one, what is very important for us, is the, the sustainability part. Um, it's gonna be the sustainability of the, the resources we use. It's on the one hand side, it's the, the water itself. On the other hand side, it's the, uh, the, the material we build our products and last but not least it's also the energy you need to to put to to heat up the, the drinking water and to get to get a comfortable situation under the shower that's the for me the, the third point so uh, may maybe most of you uh, have faced this effect uh, at least in a hotel so you go to a very nice hotel it's all clean it's all perfect you open the shower and you have to wait for five minutes so that's not for us not the, the way we want to define comfort um, you should have the, the right quality the right temperature uh, in a in in a short time and to, to save the resources and uh, to save at least time for all of us. The last part, uh, that's where the government is in, uh, is the hygiene aspect because water is a beverage. So it's the, the only source uh, you have in the building um, where it's, you are strongly regulated, you have Legionella, you have bacteria inside, and uh, for this we need to take care and digitalization helps us here to understand uh, the, the conditions we have in the water system much better than before. I would like to jump into two of these topics in the hygiene and in the sustainability a little bit more in detail why it's important for us. So. On this map, you can see the, the Legionella disease uh, in 2017. And uh, the number is not that high. So these are the deaths uh, due to Legionella uh, in Europe. Uh, but it's surprising that during the last four years, this rate increased about 70% through Europe. So we have you have a huge increase of the Legionella disease, um, also in a quite a rich environment as Europe. And it's not only that the, the southern country have this problem, it's also about Switzerland and uh, it's also about Germany. So they have the rates above 6 to 70 percent. Um, why do we see this effect? Um, it's out of our view, it's quite strongly linked to the global warming. So quite hot summers, uh, the environmental temperature is increasing, uh, the dis water distribution networks in the streets uh, are heating up and you, you get into a temperature area where the bacteria like to grow. So you get above 25 degrees. Uh, in the pipe systems, and that's usually the area um, where bacteria, uh, it's a, it's a bacteria-friendly environment. Um, on the other hand side, we have the sustainability, sustainability effects, and it might be not the right graphic for, for 2020, but usually um, in the 1970s, uh, we used about 30% for traffic, for travel. We used about 30% uh, on the industry and another third 
um, on on living and and building environment and if you go the decades in front so what mainly has changed is that our buildings today uh, they have a much better isolation um, they usually are quite uh, have a quite good recuperation of energy um, but what was stable is um, that we still use the same amount of energy uh, inside of the buildings so and this is where the digitalization can help to really understand do we need this energy can we use the energy um, so what is digital retrofit for us um, and i would like to have these three slides because they do quite good explain what what our journey is and usually if you are in the mechanical world you have in in large buildings so this is a, a multifamily house you have a circulation pipe here where you continuously circulate warm water and at every end of this circulation pipe you have a valve like that and you can you can uh, screw it on the left and on the right to open the valve and close it a little bit more and trying to balance all these different circulation loops and what you usually see in the buildings is uh, water is like energy so the easiest way for water uh, is the best way so usually the, the closer you are um, at the boiler system then you have a high temperature a good temperature for us is about uh, above 55 degrees and the more far away you are uh, the lower are these temperatures so what are you doing you call the plumber the plumber get, goes into the building uh, runs on, on every valve uh, sometimes these circulation loops they are not vertical they they are horizontal so he needs to go up the stairs and go down the stairs and one main effect is if you change something on the on the first circulation loop you will also change the, the water uh, circulation loop and the first water circulation loop so they influence each other and this is one of the the main points so um, circulation types do interact with each other and that's the limit for this mechanical world because um, it's almost impossible to balance large buildings manually because all the time you change something or just uh, the users of this building change so imagine um, uh, a sports place in the evening you have a short time there are quite a lot of people inside and, and then the rest of the weekend there's no one so you have a contamination problem in your building and that's why we, uh, studies uh, point out that over 90 percent of the buildings are not sufficient hydraulic balance so what does this mean they are just unhygienic so uh, there is a possible problem of uh, bacterial contamination inside of the system and the other aspect is um, it's very difficult to document the conditions of the of the building for the public health authorities because if you have if you are building owner and you have a legionella uh, disease uh, case in your building um, then in switzerland it's the, uh, the cantonal surgeon who will uh, be on place and and asking questions about what have you done uh, what's the temperature uh, one month ago two months ago and if you cannot can you document that then 
you get in real trouble. So what have you done in the first step? We just replaced uh, this mechanical valve by an electromechanical valve. Uh, we added uh, a gateway to control these different valves uh, to just uh, be able to to really steer these these different circulation loops from a central place. Uh, the benefit of this is you can now send the plumber to one single place, and the system will all automatically balance uh, your building to a proper temperature. So, one outcome of this was. Uh, digital components on the field level uh, must must be plug and play installable by one provision. So what does this mean? It's very important that you that the plumber do not need to call the electri the electrician uh, to install the valves or to to cable on uh, the gateway or whatever, because usually for the plumber the system the electromechanical system is too complex. And for the electrician, it's too easy. So both of them, they, they don't want to touch the system. So you need to do something where you can just uh, make it that easy that the plumber is not afraid to, to touch uh, this new technology. Um, the other one is the install base must be easily upgradable by the new technology. So you can imagine we have a lot of buildings uh, all around, they, they have a certain age. They might be built in the 70s, built in the 80s. And you really need to take the old component out of the installation, put the new component in the installation uh, to make it uh, as easy to, to upgrade uh, for, for the plumber on site. Um, the benefit for the customer is that we really have the, have the mesh of data out of the product. It's now in the market since uh, almost three years um, that we can reduce the energy consumption for portable hot water by 25% just doing a proper hydraulic balancing. Uh, on the other hand side, uh, with a system like this, you need to be on site to make uh, optimizations. Um, and what we also learned is usually in, in multifamily homes, the, the building technician who is responsible for maybe 10, 20 buildings uh, has usually no access to the technics room. Uh, that's another person, so always uh, the technician wants to be on site. Uh, he needs and optimize something. He needs to call uh, a certain person of the building uh, to get uh, to get access to the room. So that's why we decided to to start the project with Akenza. Uh, to develop the product, we call it High Clean Connect. And it's more or less shown here that we have different buildings where we already have the product inside this High Clean Automation system. And we need somehow a central point uh, to give the user access to his different buildings or the owner uh, to become access for, for our service teams um, to support the user to optimize these buildings. Um, and we also have our quite big client group, that's the facility management companies. So what are we able now to offer? So we can now remotely monitor um, the different installations. Uh, we have a central place for the alarms. We can control uh, the different systems. Uh, we can update them and we can offer remote services uh, just with our technicians to, to really um, 
try to, to get the best out of the buildings or the, the, the lowest energy cost for our customers. So uh, we have now a centralized control for multiple assets. Uh, for this facility management companies, we have a massive reduction of the on-premise services. So they don't need to jump into a car and then drive from the one and the left side of Zurich to the right side of Zurich and then to Basel. So they can do the most of the services uh, remotely. Uh, still, it's quite important that um, the new service is easily upgradable uh, to the existing installations. So the new technology needs to be added to the existing product without additional components. So this was one key factor for us. Uh, the ben benefit for us is uh, we now finally know our end customers. We usually don't know them. Uh, we usually just know the, the distributors and we know how much the distributors sell in which area, but we do not know where, where our products are, are built in. And that's a great benefit for us to really then uh, evolve um, new business models, new service systems, and also give the basis for continuous revenue streams. So trying to come to an end, conclusion for us, um, every step in the digital retrofit creates savings for our customers. I think that's very important to get that in mind. And for sure, it also uh, creates additional revenue streams uh, for our company. So it's somehow a win-win situation here. And it really pays off for the customers. Uh, so the, the, the energy consumption is more expensive. Uh, saving you have on the energy consumption is higher usually than the uh, the amount you have to pay to to add uh, to invest in a high clean automation system and connected product can serve as a door opener for new customer relationships so we now know the end customers and we also understand much better how our systems are installed in the buildings and how they are used in the buildings because uh, that's for us uh, in r d it's it's yeah it's it's like a diamond because you can then jump on on this this data and really think how how you can add or change existing products uh, to to even uh, help the customer more in his daily behavior to make it more comfortable and so on. And uh, the third point is uh, cloud-based products help us to explore new business models and also new ideas. So it's about growing business, it's about customer understanding, and it's uh, about win-win uh, uh, situations for uh, for George Fish and their end customers. So that's for me the end of the presentation. Uh, I think question we do uh, at the end of the session. So if you would like to have more information, um, visit us on connectgfps.com uh, to make a little bit. Uh, your price still here in this round uh, for our product and I would like to hand over back to Fabian. Yeah, thank you very much, Philip. That was really interesting, um, your insights that you have given from this product. And I think it showed clearly um, a handful of really big benefits that a smart connected product offers to you and also to the market. Um, so, Please feel free to drop any questions you have 
um, in the chat. And meanwhile, I'd like to hand over to Leonard. Looking forward to hear his speech. So welcome everyone. I hope you see my screen and you can hear me clearly. Um, first of all, thank you very much, Fabian, Alexis, and also Jonas for, for having me and giving me the possibility to talk a bit uh, about digital twins or digital retrofitting from the, the academic or research perspective. Um, my name is Linard. I'm working at the Competence Center for Product Management at the Zurich University of Applied Sciences. And um, we do a lot of projects with companies, but we also do research. And um, the framework that will be part of my presentation is uh, the, the core element of my dissertation that I'm working on. So I'm not, not yet a, a doctor, but I'm working on it and hopefully will achieve it within the next year. So um, I'm gonna look at the topic from a little bit a different perspective uh, in compared to, to Philip and um, First of all, I would like to show you the, the agenda of my, my short presentation. And I will start with a short and a provocative uh, question, whether you uh, really know what a digital twin is and if you also know what your teams, your R&D and innovation teams think a digital twin is. Then in the second part, I will shortly, very superficially, uh, show you the digital twin conceptual framework that I developed together with colleagues in my team and uh, we'll have to cut out the data resources part, uh, which is also one of the uh, three main dimensions uh, because we don't have too much time today. And um, I was asked to focus on the value creation part. And then of course, uh, what is uh, always uh, um, in the biggest interest of the companies is what are the business model impact that I can create with my digital twins. And then I will uh, sh close with some key takeaways uh, that we have uh, gains through our research and also from our projects that we had with different companies. So first of all, let's uh, start with a short definition or an overview of the definition of what a digital twin actually is. Um, all of you probably know that the digital twin concept is one of the key applications for the innovation of product service systems, but um, maybe you think you know what it is, but as said, are you sure that the other people in your company or in your team understand the same um, or think it is the same? What you see here on the left is the, the most used uh, definition of a digital twin from Glaskin and Stargle. It's from 2012, which is very old for a such fast and dynamic evolving concept. Um, a digital twin was then defies, defined as a multi-physics, multi-scale, probabilistic, ultra fidelity simulation with real time sensor data and also a physical model. So you can see that here on the right in the picture, you have a, a physical asset. So this is one uh, of the core um, elements of this definition. And you have then the digital twin, the digital representation, which is fed with real time operational data, which is of course um, often an overkill. So in short, they define it as a one-to-one -one digital representation of a physical asset, which is updated in real time, but this often is not achievable or it's just too expensive. And that's why in practice, this definition is kind of outdated. Because the digital twin definition, it has been enriched over time, or let's say it has been en enlarged. So um, you can also understand the different things under a digital twin. First of all, it's not anymore um, given that it has to be a uh, representation, a digital representation of a physical asset. It can be a digital representation of anything that is of value for an organization. That can be, of course, a physical device or a subsystem or a plant, but it can also be a software or it might, might even be a process. Or yeah, especially if you if you're talking about um, uh, services which don't, exist uh, which don't have physical devices included, then of course it is only a process, for example, it might be a value stream. So the, the definition is now that a, digital rep, that a digital twin is only a digital representation, which is sufficient to meet the requirements of a set of use cases. So we have these two things. First of all, you don't need a physical assets, asset to, to mirror in a digital 
um, world and you also don't have to have it fully um, fully represented. It can be a simple data set. You don't need to have real-time data. It might even be uh, enough if you have an update every day, maybe even every week might be sufficient for your use, use case so that in the end you also have a return on investment which is posit uh, positive. So authent authenticity is not a sign of quality. It can be very, very simple data set and it already creates value for you and also your customers. So there are different definitions or understandings what a digital twin is. And that's why it is very important for companies to clarify that. Because you have R&D teams and innovation teams working on this kind of innovation projects, they are very interdisciplinary. You have engineers, you have software developers, you have business developers, you have maybe even sales guys in, the, in these teams. And they have different understandings of these concepts, but they have an enormous need for communication. And what you see on the right here is simple. The more people you have, the more lines you have. That's also then, of course, more possibilities for misunderstandings. If you want to allow them to work towards this common goal, they need to have a base, they need to have a reference to communicate. So that's why we strongly recommend to use reference models or reference framework so that you can facilitate the communication and um, create common understandings of these key terms and concepts. So it doesn't depend, you can take different uh, definitions, um, just define for you and your company, your use cases, what a digital twin should be and do it in a way that everyone understands it. And to communicate your definition, this reference models really helps. We created one and uh, we presented and discussed it with, uh, I don't know, 20 plus companies. Uh, it resulted in the end in a end of 42. So we got 42 single people who responded then on the use or what they think was good about the concept was bad and what they think it uh, provides, what kind of benefits for practical use. And what you see here, the top two uh, criteria are the improvement of the individual understanding and also this uh, facilitation of the transfer of system details between the parties involved. So a reference framework really helps you at the beginning of project, at the beginning of the journey to make clear for everyone what you understand um, of uh, what you think a digital twin has to be for your company. And this really helps uh, to, to avoid misunderstandings, which, which often only later in the process then will pop up and of course it leads to some problems. Good, um, now I hopefully um, uh, made you understand why you should use a conceptual framework and now I will shortly uh, show you um, yeah, an excerpt of the digital twin conceptual pr uh, framework that we developed and also yeah, evaluated and uh, challenged with uh, people from practice. And um, we will also go on and further develop it. The framework that we built uh, consists of three main dimensions. And um, we distinguish here the, the data resource dimension, which I'm not able to talk today because we don't have so much time. Um, so I will focus on the uh, value creation dimensions, which are um, separated in the external value creation, which is actually that dimension that you all probably know and which is often in focus. This is the customers, this is the market, this is your business model. So what values can you create for your customers in the external systems in the market? And ho hopefully you will also be able to capture that value uh, by additional revenues, more margin, and maybe even a change in business models. But there is also another dimension where you can create a lot of value, which is the internal value creation, um, which is often neglected, uh, often forgotten about. And these are your internal processes, um, but also um, insights that you gain. Um, Philip also said this, you can gain a lot of insights and data about your customers, how they use their, your, your products, and uh, therefore you can create a lot of value internally in your own, own uh, dimension, let's say that. So, of course, this is not uh, the whole model. As you can see here, it's a, a little bit more detailed and I will shortly guide you through the, the gray and the blue cube, um, explaining what are the main questions that you have to ask yourself or what are the main questions you have to answer 
for your innovation and R&D team so that they all know what is the common goal that you are working towards. If we take a look at the external value creation, which is, as I said, the, the market or uh, today we were thinking in, in systems, in ecosystems. So the first question that you need to, to answer is on which level that you want to or that you can create value with your digital twin or your digital retrofitting. Of course, you can uh, create value on the connected product level, uh, which would be a single entity, a single product. But often the, the values, they are, they're, um, they are much higher if you think on a system level. For example, fleet management might be um, an application that really helps here. But also system of systems exist. Actually, this is not even, um, these are not even all the levels that you can distinguish. We talked to some companies that said, well, we actually distinguish five or even seven uh, levels because they have components, they have uh, single products, they have systems, which is, um, might, for example, be a production machine. Then the system of systems would be a production line and the factories, again, a, a level above. And maybe you, if you even connect several factories, then maybe you even have a fifth or a seventh um, um, hierarchy level doesn't depend. Um, define it for you. What, what, what amount of levels are you going to distinguish and on which levels do you want to create value? That's very important, especially um, if you think about the second question, the second category in, in the model, which is the service goal. So what is actually the primarily goal of your value creation? Um, when, you, when you want to uh, achieve predictive maintenance for your product, then you're mainly in the availability sector. You want to maximize the, um, the availability of your products for the customer. Often this is the starting point where uh, companies start because it's uh, quite easy. Um, you can just uh, monitor and control some of the products and um, give, give the customer the um, possibility to monitor it remotely, for example. But another thing is performance. Um, so this would be the, the, the input output relations of you. Uh, if you have um, certain possibilities to, to steer the parameters of your products or systems, you can also enhance the performance or help your customer to in, enhance and improve the performance. A third category where you could create value would be the quality. Quality is a little bit um, harder to quantify and it uh, can be different things depending on your application or use case. But it could be, for example, that um, your product is more safe to use or that your customer is able to fulfill certain norms or standards, for example, ISO norms, or maybe it helps them to trace the products or their supply chain. So there are different things that uh, might be covered by this quality scheme and then um, for the model, we also have, of course, a, a big tree of these KPIs. So um, this is just at the top level. And uh, that one is very, very um, strongly influenced or orientated on this uh, overall equipment efficiency um, concept that you probably know if you work in the industry. Um, then the third axis here is the smartness matured maturity. So what level of smartness does your smart connector product or system need to have to create that value? And um, Philip also said it before that um, customers might be able to monitor uh, their products. So that would be actually even a, um, a lower mat maturity model, but we are a little bit um, uh, hard here. We say uh, the sole monitoring doesn't create any value. You have to be at least able to control the products or the system. And that can be very, very simple things. So maybe you just define some thresholds and if the thresholds, if they are reached or even uh, if, the value, if the value of the parameter goes above it, maybe it's just a, a shutdown. Maybe it's just um, an alarm or maybe they um, adjust the certain parameters, for example, start cooling the system. So very, very simple things. And with that, you already can create a lot of value, for example, and um, increase the availability of the system. But you can also um, have the um, smart connected product um, make it make it able uh, to optimize itself. So that would be also often quite simple applications. So the thresholds that you set um, for for the products or for certain parameters, they can be adjusted. For example, the 
product, it measures the temperature around it, and then it can, for example, um, adjust the threshold of temperature when it starts cooling. So also still very, very simple things, but often with that you already can uh, create a lot of value for your customers. And of course, uh, in the end, the, the sky is the limit. Your system, your product, they can reach full autonomy. That would mean that they will be able to set at least own thresholds. So they, they find out, they, they define um, um, new thresholds um, ba based on the experience that they created during the usage or maybe even from the experience, from the data that the uh, same types in other um, customers or other um, uh, yeah, facilities gained. So that, that might also be um, one case. So that's very, in very short, is the, the external value creation. And that are actually the three questions that you have to, to answer for your innovation and R&D teams to tell them what is actually our goal? What, what kind of value do we want to create? What smartness maturity do we need? And on, on which um, level um, regarding the system, we're gonna create that value. So let's jump over to the internal value creation. Um, so the main question is here, what value do we generate for ourselves? And let me say often, this is very, very, it's, it's, it's very ne neglected. When we presented the model to the, um, the experts from practice, many said after we presented or discussed the external value creation, they said, this sounds all very nice, but I'm not sure if we can get our customers to pay this value that we create, I'm not sure. So we often said, okay, then maybe you should make sure that you can create enough value internally for you that you can already um, um, justify the investments you need for these two twins. And um, often um, it's not only on the instance level. So let's talk about first about the product management levels that might be affected or improved. Often um, you just wanna improve the instances. So that would be also the application that uh, Philip talked about. So you have certain individual instances in the field and you want to optimize their availability or performance. That, that's good, that's, that's nice. Maybe you, you can reach a lot of things there, but often there's the problem that you need to convince the customer that he pays for that. But maybe you can also create value and insights for your types. So from the instances, you create insights for your types so you can develop better products. You maybe can eliminate some bugs. You um, get more information about what the customer actually wants. So you can maybe add um, ad additional types or maybe eliminate certain uh, instances that, you, that they, don't, they don't work or they don't, um, are, are not used in the field. And we also distinguish uh, a third level, which would be the master, um, which is, let's say, simply say it's the, the product portfolio perspective. So you, you um, have, for example, platforms that are used for different product types, and there you can also have insights that help you to manage and optimize the types in a, in a similar way, um, um, like the type manages the instances. This is often uh, something that um, confuse, is a little bit confusing at the beginning, usually type management, that's what you have in your ERP, companies know how to do that. They manage it. Usually they start now managing their instances, they digitalize the products. So that's also these two levels, I think, um, are quite um, common and useful uh, or often used, but the master level is often neglected because um, here you have different people responsible. So the instances are usually the responsibility of service people, the type usually um, the, the product managers or engineers are responsible for that. And on the master, you already have uh, it's maybe even C-level or some business developer, sales, marketing people are working here. And this is something which we can combine or connect all the data from these three different levels. You might gain a lot of insights that really help to improve and um, yeah, enhance your offer in the market. Then the second question that you need to address is what processes of your life cycle are affected and can be improved. And also here, often um, the focus lies in the middle of life, especially in the usage phase. So you wanna improve your, your instances, the performance that they uh, generate in the usage phase for the customers. You wanna um, make the service processes more efficient and spare part management and so on. That's everything, it's in the middle of life. But often, if you, if you 
um, make this data available also for the processes in the beginning of life, for example, product design, um, the um, value proposition design, or maybe even sales processes. If you have very nice and sophisticated product configurators, that will also uh, gain, a, that will help you to gain a lot of efficiency and also effectivity in the beginning of life cycle processes. And here you also um, have the, the possibility to very, very um, shortly uh, create these gains and you will also be easily able to quantify these, um, these gains. Um, so that will help you to justify investments in digital twins. Then the, the third um, axis that we have here is the, the time axis or um, I more like to call it the generations axis. Um, because as, as well of all the, the instances, types and masters, but as well as all the process that you um, manage during the life cycle, you actually need to know how it was in the past. You need to uh, know how it is currently. You need to monitor and steer the, the current uh, performance, the current states, and but you also need to know what you want to optimize in the future. Um, when we talk about instances in the middle of life stage, then um, you need to know how the product was built um, um, originally, how, how was the state when it left your factory. Then you need to know what is the status as maintained because um, maybe some spare parts have been changed. Maybe um, it's uh, already, um, it was wear down a little bit. The performance is not as good as in the beginning. So you also want to know some things about the future or you want to predict them, for example, uh, if you talk about predictive maintenance, when in the future you will uh, or you have to exchange certain parts. So these are the, the, the three um, or at least the three status um, generations or in the time axis, what you should think about. So that in short is the, the internal value creation and um, Hopefully, uh, you 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 uh, you had the possibility to grasp grasp the the basic idea um, because it's kind of complex and usually uh, it takes a little bit more time to explain everything in detail. So uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, the things that um, that interest you probably the most or why you came to uh, came to take part in this uh, webinar: the business model impact. So why are you doing this? Actually, many of our project partners also, um, they, they come at us and they ask right away, uh, tell me which data do I need from my digital twins so I can innovate my business model. But often this is just the end of the whole journey because you have to innovate step by step. Um, we, in, in research or in academia, we call this the servitization journey. It's a transition from products to services and uh, what I want to shortly explain here is the example of a company that most of you probably know. It's uh, Bossart, it's a Swiss company, which originally uh, just sold screws. And the value proposition was, uh, or the customer job that they had with was fasten things. The revenue model was just single sales of screws. So the revenue generator was just the product. But then what they did with the, project, the process the digitization, that they, um, they, they put uh, short um, scales um, underneath the, um, the boxes where the screws were, um, um, were, were in the inventory. So they could enhance it and say, okay, we deliver the right screw and in the right place at the right, right time. So they just, they, they just added to their value proposition some pain reliever, which is the inventory management of screws because this is usually not core competence competency for many customers. So they had now single sales, but also some recu uh, recurring revenue because they introduced these value adding services. But it's still not, it's not, not a shift of the business model. It's not a full servitization shift. They just reached that with the next step when they also introduced some gain creators. And uh, in the end, the, the whole business model really changed. So they don't sell screws anymore. What they ac actually now uh, sell is proven productivity. So you see here in the picture, they, for example, um, for the, they were consulted for the Tesla factory right before they built up the factory, how to design assembly stations, how to optimize processes, how to optimize products. And they can even um, offer now services, for example, for quality management, because they can tell you 
um, when your when your factory workers they forgot to fasten, for example, a screw because they all also have access to your uh, to your production plants. So now you also have really like new additional service. You really have innovated your uh, your business model, and the services are now the the main revenue generators. And the screw is, is is not in the focus anymore. So that's actually what most companies want or want to achieve or seek to do when they invest in digital twins or the digitization of their products. So will digital twin retrofitting change your business model and will you be able to commercialize your investments in the external value creation dimension? I will say probably not. At least not right away uh, because as I said, it's quite a long journey, but you should still do it uh, because you can stay up to date with customer expectations. The customers, they also expect you to innovate in a way. Maybe in 10 years, uh, George Fisher will not be able to ask for additional money for their digital uh, solution and the cloud solution because everyone offers it. So it's just like industry standards and customer expected, expected from you to have it. And especially if you are a premium um, a, a premium uh, company, then maybe it's just expected that you have it. So don't expect that you can generate additional revenue or ask for more money if you if you come with a little bit more value through a digital solution. But you still should do it because your customers will be more satisfied and you can also keep them. So customer retention is a very important topic because then you also have, um, you have the possibility uh, to gain enough data and in the end, maybe also get a little bit more revenue through your value adding services. Um, and in the end, you need the insights for this full servitization shift. It's not something that you can do right away. Usually you need to um, first introduce or, or retrofit your products with the data that you in the end need. For example, if you want to change to pay per use model, then you need to know how often and in what way the customers use your products before you don't have the data to calculate what price tag you have to put on a certain usage, for example, per hour or per, per drilling. Um, if, you, if we talk about Hilti, for example, you cannot, cannot answer these questions. You cannot directly shift here to pay per use if you don't have this data in the, in the, in the first step. So you have to go there step by step and iteratively uh, iteratively um, develop your business model here. And in the meantime, don't forget your internal value creation creation dimension because this is the, the um, dimension where you will be uh, able to generate value very, very fast or faster. And you will also be able to quantify the value that you create there. And um, that's the way how you can justify the investments for example, if you have a manager or on the C level, you have some people that might not be convinced right away by your project. And then also use your use the, the, the insights from your installed base to develop better products and services. So think in this time axis, think in generations, that is very important. So let me close with the key takeaways that um, that I think are the things that you really should keep in mind after today's webinar. First of all, define what a digital twin is for you, for your company and your use case, and try to keep it simple. Make a sufficient digital representation and um, don't um, expect to have a one-to-one -one model. Don't expect to have real-time uh, data because um, as Fabian and also Alexis will tell you, this is most, this, this, this just costs a hell of money because uh, data, okay, cloud, it's, it's cheaper, it's getting cheaper, but it still costs a lot of money if you, if you store too much data and big data mining is no fun. Um, and then also, if you define it, make sure that everyone in your R&D and innovation team knows this definition. Um, even better, everyone in your company should know this definition. Therefore, use and adapt reference frameworks. You don't have to use my model or any other model. Um, make, make your own model. Just, just make a nice graphical representation, define key concepts, the key terms, and make sure everyone knows it. This will help to, to avoid misunderstandings and this will, this will foster or this will facilitate the communication, especially when you have interdisciplinary teams. And yeah, you have this if you, if you have digital twin projects. Then, um, yeah, maybe you will not commercialize your investments in the external dimensions, 
And uh, many of these values are also just hard to quantify. Customer retention, satisfaction. What about brand perception? What, what is the value in dollar that the customer thinks that you are the most innovative brand in this industry? It's hard to tell. But these are also values that you create. And of course, the customer requirements, insights. So what actually they, how they use your products, what they actually need and what they would maybe um, also be willing to pay for if you innovate or deliver, deliver additional values. So these are the insights that are very, very valuable, but it's not, not easy to tell what, what's the value in dollar is. Then also, <laughs> you say, see, I often say that, don't forget the internal dimension because here you find the short term and also the quantifiable values that you create with your digital twins. And uh, don't, um, yeah, um, um, don't think that this is uh, something that you can do in a year or two. It's, it's not an innovation project. It's actually a transformation journey because if you, if you want to uh, servitize your products, this, this is a very long journey and um, uh, it's not only the products that need to get uh, changed, but also that all the processes, the thinking. Often when we ask the, the practitioners, what was what the main challenge for you? They said uh, the mindset change because technology wise, everything is possible. But our customers, our own employees, they have to change the way they think. They have to change how the company or the product works. So make small steps, work iteratively, and also involve your customers. Co-create. Don't think that you can develop your, your product um, uh, until it's perfect. And then you go out, you roll it out in the market, and, and you, you will have a lot of success. That's not how it works. Uh, seek for pilot uh, customers, um, make a minimum viable products, um, test it, co-create it with your customers. Often you just gain the insights that you need to make the perfect product when you already installed some of the, the, the uh, minimum viable products or some prototypes in the market. And last but not least, think holistic. As I said, it's, it's, it's something it's a whole transformation journey. You're not innovating products. You're actually innovating your whole company. Um, that, that's something that's uh, often neglected. So think also about other things. Think about organizational structures. Think about um, the, the, the objectives that your salespeople get. Often this is also a problem. Yeah? If, if they are paid for, um, for revenue and now they just have to sell services, subscription models. So in, in, in the first moment, their the sales volume, they, it drops, right? So they, they don't have any incentives to sell, uh, sell your products. So in the end, maybe um, the C-level says, okay, it's, not, uh, it's not, not successful, we stop the project, but actually it, it would have met the, the demands of your customers and um, you just didn't think about the incentives of the salespeople. So think holistic. It's, it's a long journey and you're really transforming your company. It's not only about some sensors that you put in your project, uh, in your products. Um, it's a lot more that you have to think of if you want to be successful in the long run. Okay, um, that's it. Actually, I tried to keep myself short. Uh, hopefully, I um, was able to explain uh, a few things. Actually, I, I could talk hours about that. Uh, Fabian knows that um, our session also took uh, a lot longer than these uh, 15 minutes. Um, and I would be uh, happy if, you, if you're interested in the topic or you want to, to know more about the, uh, the model or our projects, uh, please contact me. You can also connect with my digital twin on, on LinkedIn or just uh, send me an old fashioned email. So thank you very much. Um, sorry for taking a little bit too long and I'm happy if we have still some time to discuss some questions. Yeah, great. Thank you, Leonard. Thank you very much for all those valuable insights. I especially like the key takeaways on your last slide. I think um, that really brings it on the point. So let me share my screen quickly. Um, one second.
Yeah, so before we close the meeting, um, we have a quick Q&A session. And then um, let's have a quick look what we have in our inbox of the questions. Um, one thing I've seen is already uh, one question. I might go um, one step forward. One second. You know this already. So looking, looking at the inbox, what do we have uh, for questions? I have seen one question from Juste Hane. Um, she was asking about paying for the services. Uh, that was addressed to Philip. Philip, do you want to add something on this? I've seen you you gave the answer already, but do you have an additional information? Uh, how how is Georg Fischer uh, looking at this perspective? Yeah, I'm, uh, I think it's um, for sure. We we see the this cloud related. Uh, services um, we we see it more on the, the end user topic um, and uh, actually we we are also in a phase to uh, to to elaborate a little bit with the, this different um, this different business models um, the actual state is that uh, we decided to uh, to, to charge by by wolf so it's related to the building size or related to the size of the customers buildings um, mm -hmm. and it's in in that case it's a, it's a monthly fee uh, focused on 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 the amount of wolves you have installed yeah but you also see it just as a first start for now to see how the market reacts, what responses you will get from your customers and being there flexible in the future, what pricing model you're going to offer. Do I understood it correct? Yes. And uh, I think I could add a lot on the on Leonard slides because these are exactly the, the, the same ideas you come across um, if you if you start this journey and then having a product uh, you can control uh, if you achieve this session then you think about yes and now what's the next step so how can I optimize and so on so you, you can really um, uh, move this this ladder uh, in every every dimension um, uh, you can you can learn about the insights of the products you you launched in the market and and make them better right. uh, change something etc yeah yeah all right are there other questions in the inbox no not so far then i may have a question um for leonard um now having seen the georg fischer uh, presentation um, what do you see there um, well done in terms of uh, value detection kind of and what would you kind of propose um, to see in a midterm future maybe for Georg Fischer where to look at? Um, so first of all I think we should also speak about the, the external dimension and um, there I think it would be interesting I mean they have now a very nice smart connected product and I think it offers uh, totally the value on that level and uh, I think it would be interesting maybe I think they already thought about this um, what value can they they uh, provide for the, the higher levels for example for for a smart building application maybe even think bigger um, talk about uh, water systems for the, the whole town or the city, smart city applications, smart city platforms. What kind of data would they be interested? Um, maybe if you have a problem with these uh, legionnaires or legionnaires, 
Um, maybe you can even help them to detect not only that they have it, but also why it, it came, where, where it comes from. Uh, so they cannot only like distinguish the fire in that case, but also make sure that it doesn't happen anymore in the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely a thing to look at. Yeah. Um, what do you think, uh, Philip? What are your um, key takeaways, your personal key takeaways from from the scientific approach that we have heard now from Leonard? <laughs> what I um, mentioned your personal favorite, and where <laughs> you might look deeper on it. Uh, I think it's uh, one one set one sentence is very important. You, you need somehow to visualize it in, for your own company that all the people inside of your company understand uh, uh, the path or the journey you want to go. Mm -hmm. and, um, what, and I think that's, that's very important and uh, this might get more important the, the bigger the company is. And um, I think that's for for me one topic where I, I think the this scientific model might be a little bit an overkill to to put it to 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 the full company, but uh, still gives a lot of ideas. Uh, um, uh, which part you can address, and I'm also pretty sure that. Um, if you subtract it uh, to a, to an easier concept, um, you can you can also uh, develop the the model further to the needs of your journey. So you don't need to address uh, 360 degrees uh, at the one point. Um, that's the the one key takeaway. Um, the the other one uh, we we already know it, but um, uh, there are, if you go on this journey of, of, of digitalization, uh, digitalize your product, um, then you have a lot of internal stakeholders. They, they, they are measured in a way or have their objectives in a way um, which, which do not allow to, to, to just take them on board and, and uh, uh, have an easy run uh, uh, to, to a new glory world. So it's, it's really a lot of work. It's a lot of um, convincing people that, uh, that, uh, that it has to, is the right journey. It, it creates value, but maybe differently than before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If I may add something here, yeah. Um, so, so the model, it's, it's, it's generic, it's very complex. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's actually the goal was to show the whole continuum of possibilities that digital twins give. And of course, for a, a specific use case or a specific company, it uh, might be simplified uh, by a lot. And um, actually what you said, um, Philip, that's what, what you mentioned, that's very important. So uh, often when we went into companies and we presented the model, uh, that then the, we always asked for, for that we have some representatives, for example, from the IT uh, sector, from, from the engineering, from, from sales, marketing, business development. And often then, for example, the product manager said, yeah, that would be really nice. We could do this, but we, we don't, we lack this kind of data. And then the IT guy said, no, that's not true. We started the project half a year ago. So now we have this data, but they, they just didn't know. So it's very important to, to have such a graphical representation so that you can also, for example, connect the dots of different digitalization projects that are already running inside the company. So mm -hmm. that's, that's really, it's all about communication. And, uh, mm -hmm. and that, that's, I think, is a crucial factor for the success of such uh, innovation projects. And um, if I might ask, because there was the question in the chat from, from Anne, um, no, I'm not, not the only a researcher. Um, you can hire me and maybe you don't even have to hire me. I um, will be happy to maybe give a, a short presentation inside your company if you're interested. 
and uh, we also help for uh, help the companies to um, yeah to to start the journey for digital twins. And we are yep. a University of Applied Sciences, so of course we have to apply the knowledge that we we create or that is created created also by other researchers. So yep. uh, I'm happy if you get in contact with me. Yeah, yeah, perfect. That was actually the question from Anne. Uh, for those ones who haven't seen it, uh, they were asking whether Leonard uh, can be hired um, as, a, as a consulting team. Uh, probably, yeah, depends on the industry or I don't know, um, that might be a deal. Um, but um, as it says, um, University of Applied Sciences, so really applied, um, I think you are really, really close um, to, to the Swiss economy and supporting um, um, customers in real projects. So therefore, please get in touch with Leonard. Um, I think that's a really good procedure. I think um, this is pretty much it um, with those questions. Uh, we hope you guys enjoyed um, the webinar. Uh, it was my great pleasure uh, moderating uh, the webinar. Um, a big, big thank you to Philip and Leonard. Uh, you did an awesome job and you gave really, really nice and valuable insights. And for further questions, please do not hesitate to contact Akensa. Um, if you're planning your next IoT project, we are more than happy to help you. Uh, please contact us on this email address that you see on the screen. And yeah, there is nothing less to say than um, thank you again. Um, have a good rest of the year and then Merry Christmas quite soon. And um, stay safe and yeah, have a, good, have a good start next year. Thank you very much and bye. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Bye. 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 Thank you.